chi-square test is broader than that. You can use it to test, for example, any set of proportions that add up to one. Uh, for example, what's your favorite kind of pizza? All right, I'm not going to list every kind of pizza here. There's our classics here, pepperoni, sausage. Okay, I could do sausage and mushroom. I could do, you know, whatever. There's Hawaiian. My son hates Hawaiian. <laughs> He's like, why would you put pineapple on a pizza? I like it. We always used to call it Canadian bacon and pineapple, but now we call it Hawaiian. Uh, and one more, uh, the works, five meat or whatever, veggie, whatever. Okay. So you got uh, four kinds of pizzas there, pizza type. And we could have no hypothesis values for what you think the uh, favorite picks are. Null values for favorites. Your hypothesized null values. Maybe you think pepperoni is definitely preferred by maybe not a majority of people, but a plurality. You know the difference between a majority and a plurality? Majority is what? Greater than 50%. Plurality is not necessarily greater than 50%, but the highest percentage is a plurality. Should not go out of a stats class, technically speaking, without knowing that. Let's say pepperoni is not a majority, but a plurality. You think. 40% of the people, their, their favorite pizza is pepperoni. And all the other ones are going to be smaller. Sausage, you think it's 0.3. Hawaiian, you think it's okay. I, I guess I'm going to go down one by one here. Is 0.2 and five meat is 0.1. So those are your null values for the favorites. How many people are we going to survey their favorites and they can only pick from these four? Let's say we survey a thousand people at random and is a thousand. Oh, let's make it a hundred. So survey a hundred people at random. What's your favorite from these four? We'll get some observed values. We can also compute expected values. You could call them EI equals N times PI as the book does in chapter 15. Assuming N is 100, multiply by these proportions, 100 times 0.4 is 40, 100 times 0.3 is 30, 100 times 0.2 is 20, 100 times 0.1 is 10. What are the observed values? Call them OI. Make your O cursive so you don't think it's a zero. Because of randomness, even if these are the true proportions, true population proportions, you're not going to get exactly these numbers. Let's try to make them far enough away from the expected values that hopefully we end up rejecting the null. Let's make this one be a 30, say this one be 33. This one to please my son, let's make way, be down, way down at five. And then these do have to add up to a hundred. So that's gonna leave, what am I up to 68 there? It's gonna leave 32 for that one, wow. So that those look far enough away from the expected values that I'm sort of thinking we're probably going to reject the null because what is the philosophy of hypothesis testing? You're assuming the null is true. You're giving it the benefit of the doubt until, quote unquote, proven otherwise. Until you have strong enough evidence to suggest you think the null is not true. Getting a p-value that's real, real small. 
observing a test statistic that gives you a p-value very small, meaning you have observed something rare if the null is true. Probably getting some sort of large test statistic. Although, what is the direction of the alternative hypothesis here? Does it have a direction? The null really is that P1 is 0.4, P2 is 0.3, P3 is 0.2, and P4 is 0.1. And what's the alternative? The alternative is just the opposite of the null, meaning at least one of those P's is not as specified. You could just write not the null. <laughs> at least one PI is not as specified. Although if, if one of them is not as specified, then at least another one would also be not as specified, right? Because they have to add to one. <clears throat> Again, intuitively, the chances the null is true is essentially zero. Right, that these numbers are exactly right. It's probably even really close to zero if you gave yourself some cushion with each one of them. It'd be very unlikely to all the, for the, all those to be true, even with a little bit of cushion. Though, technically speaking, nobody can really figure out that probability because nobody knows the population well enough. And only God knows if it's true or not. And with regard to truth, it's probably not true, but we give the novel the benefit of the doubt. That's the purpose of hypothesis testing. You don't reject it until you got strong enough evidence against it. So we need a test statistic. And what chapter 15 gets into is the test statistic happens to have a chi-square distribution. So we call it a chi-square test statistic. Chi squared test statistic. That's not an X, that's a chi. Chi square. Summation I goes from one to not N. This is a little tricky with the notation. N is the sample size of the number of people we're surveying. 100 people. But we don't have 100 categories of pizza, we only have four. The book calls it K for the number of categories or bins. This is categorical data that we've got about pizza preferences. Observed minus expected Squared divided by expected is the way you compute it. <clears throat> With how many degrees of freedom, not n minus one, but k minus one. So in this case, that's three. K equals four for us, four categories of pizza. I could have added more pizzas and so k would be bigger. That's the way I chose to do it. Technically speaking, calling this a chi-square random variable is actually only an approximation. And the approximation becomes better and better under certain conditions related to how big these numbers are actually. So we got to compute, uh, we could extend the table and compute now let's just go ahead and compute these fractions right up straight away here. OI minus EI squared divided by EI. So here we've got 30 minus 40 squared divided by 40. So that'll be 100 over 40. On uh, what's that, 2.5? Relatively extreme, relatively large value there. This next one's going to be smaller. 
33 minus 30 squared over 30. That'll be 9 over 30, which is 3 tenths, 0 0.3. This next one's going to be fairly big. 5 minus 20 squared over 20. 15 squared is 225 divided by 20. Going to get something over 10 here. It's going to be an extreme one. 11.25. And then this one's going to be extreme as well. 32 minus 10 squared over 10. 22 squared over 10 will be 48.4. So yeah, the sum of these things is going to be pretty big. We're going to get a pretty extreme observed value of chi squared. At least it seems that way. And now the number of degrees, degrees of freedom is certainly going to affect the p-value. 62.45 is the observed value of chi-squared for these data. What is the p-value? The p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic as extreme or more extreme. In this case, <clears throat> that means chi-squared greater than or equal to 62.45. Assuming the null is true, which you don't have to write in the notation, I'm implicitly assuming the null is true by, by computing these expected values as part of the calculation. And how many degrees of freedom is, is, is it? It's three degrees of freedom. So you could put a subscript of a three there. That subscript means the degrees of freedom. It does not mean an area to the right of something. Could use the table. We can also use the calculator here. It's chi-squared CDF, so I'd have to, whatever I get, I have to do one minus it. Or I, I guess I could do a different lower and upper. I could do a lower of 62.45 and an upper of essentially infinity. Let's do it this way. What should I expect here? This is a CDF value with a high upper this should be a fairly large number, close to one. It says it is one. Does it equal one exactly? No. Is it carrying more decimal places internally? I don't know. Doesn't look like it. Uh, the p-value is essentially zero. I wonder if we did the other way, if we get something with like, that would be like 10 to the negative 30 or something. I don't know, let's see. Does it? I'm not using the E there. Will this, will this work? Okay. About 1.76 times 10 to the negative 13. Probably best to write is approximately two times 10 to the negative 13. 10 to the 12th, 10 to the positive 12 is a trillion, right? Yep. This is like one 10 trillionth of a chance of observing something this extreme or more extreme if we assume the null is true. Therefore, we are very confident the null is false. We reject it. Is it possible to do the, the classical approach instead of the p-value approach? Yeah. If we were doing the classical approach with deciding what alpha is ahead of time, say 0 0.05. So I'm not sure if the calculator has an inverse chi-square. Nope, it doesn't look like it does. You'd have to well, you could use the table. You could use some guessing. Let's use the table to help us do some guessing. Chi squared table is what I'm looking for. Three degrees of freedom. Well, 
uh, and the, the table gives us a good enough answer. Three degrees of freedom. These numbers up here, you can see by the shading, are CDF values, areas to the left. We want the area to the right to be 0 0.05, so the area to the left has got to be 0 0.95. Three degrees of freedom are critical values, 7.81. The rejection region is when chi squared is greater than or equal to 7.81. When alpha is 0 0.05. And then you could you could test it with the calculator if you wanted to. So this should give 0.95. Yeah. Okay. So yes, you can do it, do it in terms of rejection region without figuring out a p-value, but you should feel comfortable either way. Would I put this in the in-class exam? Possibly. Yeah. It's. Straightforward enough that we, we could probably do that. Okay, so that's something you should be able to do for the in-class exam. Okay. 